Hello, my name is Gilda Ross and I am the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. I'm happy to welcome all of you here tonight and I'm happy to welcome our distinguished panel as well. This is the 25th year of the Glenbard Parents Series and uh, prominently figured in our brochure are these words. We welcome all public, private, parochial, homeschooling parents, caregivers, students, and school staff. All of our events are free and open to all and we require no registration. So if this is your first time to a Glenbard Parent Series program, a special welcome to you. Our programs really touch parents of children of all ages, grandparents are welcome as well. You will always learn something when you come to a Glenbard Parent Series program. Um, Tonight, in addition to the regular sponsors that you saw um, on that initial slide, we also want to thank the following villages for their support in promoting this event and being instrumental in making this event come to be. Uh, Glen Ellen, Lombard, Glendale Heights, Carroll Stream, Wheaton, Villa Park, Naperville, um, and many others. Um, I'm looking at a slide that says GPS Glenbard Parent Series in its 25th year. Um, and because it is our 25th year, uh, in addition to bringing back our very favorite people, we have also made time and had the opportunity to have some special events. And tonight is exactly one of those special events where we are responding to the needs of our community. Um, the mission of the Glenbard Parent Series is really to bring families together around the opportunities and the challenges of parenting kids today. Our, our motto this year is now more than ever GPS. If you're a social media person, please like us on Facebook and spread the word. Everyone is always welcome, always. The format tonight is we'll hear from our distinguished panel um, in the following order. First up is Brian Vera Cruz who lives in Lombard, one of Glenbard's own. Um, he is a professional engineer and rail safety program administrator with the Illinois Commerce Commission. Following Brian, we'll hear from Kurt Blodgett. He is the senior manager, risk management, senior manager and risk management with Union Pacific. Next up will be Dr. Lanny Wilson. Dr. Lanny Wilson is a obst former obstetrician gynecologist, retired now, who has made it his mission to keep families safe around trains. He now serves as the chairman of the DuPage Railroad Safety Council. He's very involved on the board of the DuPage County Health Department, one of our sponsors as well. Thank you to them. Um, and then following Dr. Wilson, we'll hear from Dr. Jason Washburn. Uh, Dr. Washburn is a consultant at Amita Behavioral Health, a director of graduate studies and professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Northwestern University and director of research in the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's Hospital. We'll hear from our speakers. There'll be a chance for questions and chat afterwards. So without further ado, Brian Bierkus, please take it away. Thank you so much, Gilda. I'm so happy to be here with everyone today. Uh, as you noted, I am a Glenbard parent and my work takes me all over the state. Um, but obviously with the amount of rail lines, crossings and everything that we have going on in this area, we have a, a great focus through here. So my job today is to kind of set up the uh, the table or provide lead off so that we can give a context of the rail network in Illinois, uh, some statistics and what we do in terms of engineering, education, enforcement, and then what we have as far as three distinct timelines. So with that, we'll get into more details as far as the Western suburbs and especially the uh, Glombard area. So as I noted, we'll give a little uh, discussion as far as the crossing network, the Illinois Commerce Commission, go through rail incidents in DuPage County as they relate to Illinois, and then I'll take you through these timelines with highway rail warning devices, pedestrian warning devices, rail trespass and suicide mitigation, and together I think that provides a great lead in for everyone else's presentation. As you can see from the two maps here, Illinois is the uh, nation's rail hub with over 7,500 at grade crossings, 
uh, the number of bridges, 53 railroad companies. We have trains moving through our state and specifically the Chicagoland area uh, at 1200 per day from the Chicagoland area. So together we have a long history. This history takes us back 150 years to the 1871 Railroad and Warehouse Commission. Um, it's our 150th, 50th anniversary this year. And as the Illinois Commerce Commission, it's our 100th. So this just gives you a sense of how rail safety has played out in the state of Illinois. And these are some highlight dates, including 1955, where you see a uh, grade crossing protection fund created by the General Assembly, which now was one of the first, if not the first in the nation to put funding towards highway rail warning devices. Uh, in terms of my team, we have certified inspectors, we have professional engineers, uh, education and outreach specialists. And then we also have our great data and research policy expert, Steve Laff, who's helped me with a lot of the data we'll go through in these next uh, slides. Uh, we're a small group, but we try and cover the whole state and work with the railroads, municipalities, to everyone that you listed, we've worked with and have gone through. So we're a small group, but we do cover a lot of territory and we do take a lot of pride in um, working towards rail safety. Uh, to get into some specifics for tonight, this is a 10 year analysis of what we see in Illinois in terms of collisions and then how it relates to DuPage County. So I circled, you know, some of our more pertinent items here. In the bottom left, you can see over 10 years for the whole state of Illinois, we had about 1200 collisions at public at grade crossings, uh, 420 suicides uh, across the state and then 401 trespasser. Now, when you look at that versus DuPage County, you can see that we have a different uh, mix here. We have 55 collisions at public crossings, uh, yet we outpace in the number of suicides with 69 and then trespassers. So I think that's you know, an important statistic as we continue and we hear from Dr. Wilson and Dr. Washburn. Um, to see how this spreads out amongst our lines and what we see in DuPage County. You can see with the Union Pacific, with the Geneva sub, the West Line, BNSF, uh, through and out to Naperville, and then Metro's Milwaukee West Line, these are some of the highest volume train lines in the uh, state. And as far as the UP, West, and BNSF lines, these are some of the heaviest mixed use freight and passenger corridors in the whole country. So when you break down what we see in terms of collisions by town, you know, unfortunately, each of the communities we discussed, you know, round out the top 10. Naperville, as you can see, is our number one. And then as we go down, uh, we have Lombard, De La Park, Elmhurst, Glen Ellen, Wheaton, uh, Hinsdale, and Aurora rounds out the top 10. And as you can see, the highest collisions occur on the highest volume lines with the BNSF and the UP. So together in DuPage County over the course of the 10 year period, we had 139 incidents. When you look at the age distribution, this is always uh, something that brings back that the majority that we see are in the 40 year old male category. And you can see that we're in that 72% versus 28 with female. But as you can see in this left corner, especially with the Glenbard parent series in our 15 to 18 or 19 year old range, and we still have um, too many. So I'd like to take you through some distinct timelines. And this one is probably the most direct route. When you think of highway railroad warning devices, you, know, you can look at the left side of this timeline and we have the old days with flaggers at crossings. And then you can see as we go in quick succession, we have cross bucks that then turn to flashers, then gates. And one of our bigger um, improvements is moving to four quadrant gates like what you see on the right hand side, which is the Elizabeth Street crossing in Lombard. And the idea here is that we close off the entire crossing. So this is pretty much a direct route in terms of improvements. And as I noted, 1955 funding was started towards these and we had dedicated sources, technology advances as we move to better microprocessors. 
And now as we continue to move on, we have positive train control. So we're trying to get away from traditional track starts and trying to move into more advanced technologies. Um, so really that's what we see in terms of highway rail safety devices. When you look at pedestrian improvements in the area, um, I'll let everybody have a minute to look at this, but it's, it's not a straight line, it's circular. On the left side, you know, these are old pedestrian gates. They were installed at one time in the 50s or 60s, then they somewhat stopped for a reason. In 2001, in our timeline, uh, the Illinois General Assembly passed legislation allowing pedestrian bridges to be built with the Grade Crossing Protection Fund assistance. So what we've seen, uh, our first bridge was actually in Wheaton with the Lori Most Bridge over by the DuPage County facility. Um, and then from there, we have passes signs. Then what you might see from Elmhurst and Glen Ellen, we have our danger another train coming as far as second train issues. Um, then we continue and we build more bridges and then we end up to more sealed corridors that you see on the right hand side. And then you see platform improvements at stations like in Villa Park. This isn't, this has not been a linear pattern. It's more like a, a roller coaster with a loop and we keep progressing. Uh, as far as commission staff, we're in favor of pedestrian gates. We want to see more utilized all over the state. They provide a barrier in the most recognizable um, message to users. And then in terms of bridges in our program, uh, we have a new pedestrian underpass program for Glen Ellen. We're helping with um, Elmhurst. We had worked with Lombard, Winfield, uh, Wheaton. So we intend on continuing all of that work as well as all of the warning device work that I had just discussed. To get into the next timeline area, trespass and suicide mitigation, this does not have as much history as the previous ones. And really it's been in the last five years that I've seen the greatest amount of uh, focus and activity. Uh, in 2000, Steve Laffey from my office, who's our data uh, policy analyst guru, he started tracking suicides. I'm not sure if there were others at that time, but we wanted to try and get a good track on what was taking place. As you can see with the timeline, then you had the uh, American Association of Railroads uh, and early studies that were completed. There was education and enforcement programs, certain amount of fencing and landscaping and other areas were uh, a great focus as well as safety blitzes at stations that I'm sure everybody uh, who commutes downtown would have seen. And you know, also within this time period, going back to the previous slide, we had additional bridges being built to help trespass issues. But in the last five years to the right of the timeline, there's been a greater focus and it's been great to see. The medical, medical community has really uh, come into greater focus and really has taken on the issue with other partnerships. Metro and the Union Pacific have gone through and educated their employees and I'm sure we'll hear more about that coming up. And then on the national level, we've seen the Transportation Research Board and the Federal Railroad Administration really move into studies to try and um, dedicate resources and try to see what the best policies, mitigations may be. So are there advances in technology with artificial intelligence, monitoring? Um, do we look at basic things such as fencing? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah, as we progress, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the federal level with the FRA and continued studies and different programs. And for Illinois, last legislative season or session, we had Illinois House Bill 4248 that was introduced. And that's still working its way through, but that was to allow the Illinois Commerce Commission and the Great Crossing Protection Fund uh, to have it used for trespass mitigation. So we will see where that goes with this legislative session, um, but that kind of gives you a focus and a little preliminary as we go into the other uh, sessions. And as we finish uh, this lead in, you know, I have a new 16 year old driver and I asked him, I said, you know, what do you do when you come to a crossing and the gates are down? He said, you don't go around, you stay there. I said, that's great. What do you do if there's a problem and your car stalls on the tracks? 
I think he said I'd get out of the car and that's exactly what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to get out at an angle and go towards the direction of the train. Um, but I'm not sure if everybody's aware of these blue signs that you see on the right hand side. These are actually on the warning devices at every crossing in the country. And if there's ever an issue, if you see somebody stuck on the tracks, uh, like we had in Lombard at Grace Street uh, earlier this year, or last year, I'm sorry, um, this is the number that you call. And I also recommend calling 911. So I'll leave it with that. If there's any questions or any other rail safety concerns, here's the contact information for my office and then for myself and Steve Laffey. And for a deeper data dive and analysis, I've included a whole uh, deck of other slides that Steve produced if you want to see more information. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt from the Union Pacific to go through uh, his section. So thank you again, Gilda, and thank you to everyone. Thank you so much. It's loading up. Yeah, my my, uh, my control went away for me, and I apologize for that. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm Kurt Blodgett. I'm a senior manager with risk management for Union Pacific Railroad. As uh, most of you are very likely aware, Union Pacific runs right uh, uh, through the uh, communities of, uh, of Glen Ellen, Lombard, and, uh, and many others. Um, uh, as probably you also know, Union Pacific started out on July 1st of 1862, uh, signed into uh, by a charter of uh, Abraham Lincoln himself that uh, saw the railroads uh, of the nation as uh, being the building block uh, of the country. And we've had our footprint through many uh, communities ever since. I do have a couple of uh, informational slides that'll kind of repeat what Brian said, but I think that they really hit on safety. And in my opinion, we can't hit enough of that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm employed because of uh, safety failures one way or another. And uh, as I like to say, and I, I say in pretty much all of my public presentations, uh, I'd like to put myself out of a job. Uh, uh, there's other jobs out there and uh, uh, if we all uh, are a little bit safer and help each other out, I, I think we can work to that end. Uh, Chicago uh, is the nation's railroad hub. Uh, I've got, I had some other maps uh, in this, uh, for the sake of brevity, I wanted to uh, uh, just highlight uh, that, uh, that this is a nexus of uh, all the major railroads across the nation. Uh, and I learned uh, once I came to the Chicago area uh, that uh, it is very robust with uh, uh, smaller, uh, what they call short line railroads as well. Uh, Union Pacific uh, ran about 200 metro trains daily and uh, we'll call it the pre-COVID era, uh, scaled back a little bit, but still running service on all three of our lines, which are the Metro North, Northwest and West. Uh, the same lines on the freight side, we call them the Kenosha sub that goes up to Kenosha, uh, Harvard, and then Geneva subdivisions. Uh, we have uh, two major um, uh, uh, yards in the uh, Chicago area. We used to have four, but we've scaled back on our global one and global three yards. So we have global two and global four that are west of the city that uh, incorporate a lot of our intermodal business. Important stat to note is that, uh, and this is provided by the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, a person or vehicle is hit by a train every three hours. And to me, that's a staggering statistic. It's very sobering to hear that. That's across the country. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, that represents tragedy for, uh, uh, for many families. Thankfully, uh, a lot, you know, we do strike uh, unoccupied uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, which uh, uh, people can walk away from, but we also have some unfortunate uh, uh, tragedies uh, on a daily basis across the country. And we all, we all play a part in that. Uh, 
we we will do everything that we can. I'll provide my information at the end. If anybody on this call has a smaller group, I've presented to like scout groups that want to get uh, merit badges, things of that nature. More than happy to come out on a on a smaller uh, 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 scale, especially once we get past COVID. But we can also do an online presentation. I can I can tailor it to uh, different audiences as well. Um, what what you don't see a whole lot in in uh, in uh, I, I would take it most of the uh, folks that are on this call that are in that uh, community around uh, uh, Glen Ellen area uh, or Lombard, um, uh, you don't hear a whole lot of train whistles. And when you do, it usually means that something, uh, uh, something is in the way of the trains. And that's because they have what are called uh, uh, quiet zones. And the, the communities have uh, applied for that because if the if the trains had to uh, blow the whistle for every single crossing, every single time they came through, uh, that 200 trains that goes through the, uh, the passenger only uh, through Chicago would uh, uh, very quickly multiply and uh, uh, people recognize that. But they, uh, they engineered around it through, as uh, Brian suggested, four quadrant gates, which means that they both basically block all vehicular uh, traffic in both directions on both sides of the street. So you can't go around lower gates, for example, uh, uh, to go on the opposite side of the crossing and try and uh, squeeze through. Um, there's other uh, signs out there that give you awareness of uh, railroad crossings. I always like to point those out because that's your first awareness that you could be coming upon a crossing and they're, they're designed intentionally to drive your awareness to you're about ready to come into a dangerous situation and you should be extra attentive uh, when doing so. Uh, always remember we've had we've had uh, quite a few incidents of this nature uh, with uh, particularly with a uh, 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 large truck uh, tractor trailer uh, scenarios where they have what they call short stage so they, they'll they'll park their vehicle for or stop their vehicle for a light uh, but the, the back end of their truck uh, is uh, not in the clear. It's, we, we call it being in the foul of the tracks. Um, and uh, that can happen with uh, uh, vehicles. We have, there's a lot of um, uh, highways that are adjacent to railroad tracks. And um, sometimes people panic a little bit. I, I will note, and I think it's really important to note because uh, I've seen news articles before where they'll, they'll say that the, the gate got stuck on the vehicle and stopped the vehicle, the vehicle couldn't go. Uh, those gates are designed to break away. They have what's called a shear pin in them. And if that, if that uh, gate comes down on you, your vehicle, my recommendation is break the gate and get out of the way. Uh, that gate can be replaced, but uh, your life can't be. So um, if a gate comes down on top of your vehicle, uh, proceed so that you're in the clear of the tracks because it probably means that a train's coming and, uh, and that could be a disaster, obviously. And you should allow about 15 feet uh, between your vehicle and the nearest rail. Um, as Brian suggested, this is something that I always, when I do, when I talk to driver's ed uh, courses, I always uh, uh, tell the uh, uh, the kids, you really have to think about this in advance because it's counterintuitive. When the uh, 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 a lot of times when a threat is coming at us, we want to run away from the uh, threat and we want to get away from it as quickly as possible. In this case, when the train is coming straight at you, you actually have to run towards the uh, uh, train and run away from the tracks at an angle. And the reason, uh, I won't belabor it, the reason is, is because that train is gonna strike the, uh, the object and then it's gonna become a projectile and it's gonna continue down range. So you have to run toward the train and away from the tracks uh, in order to uh, get in the clear. As uh, Brian noted, and this is one of those repeat slides, all the crossings uh, uh, in, in this area, they're required throughout the nation actually, have what this what's called an emergency notification sign or an ENS sign. It will have the number to the local railroad and that number on there um, that is in the white uh, block is basically it's a serial number or a license number for that exact crossing. So when you call that 800 number, and you give them that crossing number, they know exactly where you're at. We also recommend calling 911, but this is the fastest uh, uh, way to, to stop a train. Get, get in the clear first though, and never, ever, ever go around uh, lower gates. Uh, this was a staged uh, collision that they did as a campaign to uh, show the impact 
of, uh, of a train striking a vehicle, which we can all, uh, I think, uh, imagine, but uh, it, it's never, uh, never a good thing. Our, our crews cannot do uh, uh, basically anything. Uh, uh, once, uh, once they see a threat in front of them, especially in the uh, uh, heavily populated community, uh, the, it, the collision is likely imminent. Even, even seeing it out uh, quite a distance, a lot of times the expectation is people will clear and it just, they can't stop. And the reason they can't stop is it takes, it takes about a mile for a, a loaded freight train to stop. Uh, our, our passenger trains take a little bit less than that, but don't count on it. They're, the collision is, is more than likely imminent. Uh, it's 18 uh, football fields is another uh, uh, reference uh, for how long it takes to uh, stop. Uh, uh, the optical illusion of a train speed is about the same as when you see a plane going across the sky. You think it's just slowly moving, but we all know 500 miles per hour. Now, a train's not going 500 miles per hour, but the perception of what its speed is, and I try, I've done it myself many times testing myself, uh, I'm almost always wrong uh, compared to the radar. Um, another important thing, uh, trespassing on uh, or about railroad tracks is against the law and it's dangerous. Um, uh, this right here is a, uh, an unfortunate selfie that family actually asked us to share their story. This is out of Spanish Fork, Utah. Uh, wherein uh, they took a, a selfie that uh, uh, resulted in uh, uh, the fatality of these uh, young ladies. And it, it really spoke to me that uh, you would think that, that, you know, they've got in full control of their faculties, uh, good to hear, best hearing of your life, right? Uh, and, uh, and yet they still lost that uh, uh, attention. Uh, and this family, the family of the three girls, uh, uh, don't want to see that happen to anybody else. If anybody would like additional information, uh, you can basically Google any of the uh, uh, agencies I've discussed today, Union Pacific, Illinois Commerce Commission, Federal Railroad Administration, or FRA. And then also in Chicago, you have what's called CREATE, and it's a public-private uh, uh, venture that was a, a, a collaboration of uh, various entities that wanted to drive efficiency and safety in the uh, Chicago area. A lot of information there. And finally, that's my uh, contact information. If anybody wants to reach out to me, more than happy to uh, give a presentation or we can talk any uh, uh, safety issue you'd like. And I thank you again uh, uh, for allowing me to present to you today. And I, and I really love this series. I learned a lot in preparing for this. I looked up the Glenbard Parent Series. I think it's fantastic. My kids are out of the nest now, but I wish we had something like this. You guys are very fortunate to have this in your community. So congratulations and congratulations on 25 years as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Dr. Wilson, you I'm, are next. I'm on. Thank you so much, Kurt and Brian, for those great presentations. So much information there. Um, you know, we all have stories which shape us and prepare us for important work. This is my story that prepared me to help create the DuPage Railroad Safety Council over 26 years ago now. March 2nd, 1994 started off like any other school day in the Wilson household. Our 17 year old son, Luke, and our 14 year old daughter, Lauren, were out the door early that morning. Our goodbyes were a bit rushed so that they could arrive at school on time. Probably sounds familiar with some of the parents out there and their children. We look forward to getting together that evening though, because it was opening night for a play called The Phantom Tollbooth at the Theater of Western Springs, just a, a few uh, villages away, where Lauren had a starring role that evening. She was an aspiring actress. She was gonna be great. First the silver screen, then maybe off to the political scene, who knows. My day was a usual Wednesday, rounds at the hospital, office hours, teaching the family practice residents at the Hinsel Family Medicine Residency about obstetrics and gynecology, my specialty in medicine, just like Gilda's husband. When I arrived home, I would have just enough time to grab a bite to eat, change and get to the theater on time with the family. But when I walked in the door, there was an eerie silence. There was no Luke, no Lauren, nor Linnea, my wife, and, and Lauren's soup was sitting on the table, untouched and getting cold. 
it felt like an episode of the Twilight Zone. I was walking around the house looking for clues and I got a call from a friend who thought that I should sit down because she wanted to tell me that Luke and Lauren's car had been struck by a train at the Monroe Street crossing in our town of Hinsdale. Their injuries were too serious for them to be taken to our local community hospital. Lauren's tragic injuries were, were the worst. So she was placed in an ambulance and rushed ahead. Linnea arrived at the scene in time to ride in the other ambulance with Luke. I thought I, I practiced this several times, so I thought it'd be easier, but it's never easy to tell the story. The destination for both ambulances was Loyola University Medical Center, the nearest level one trauma center. Our friend offered to drive me to Loyola, but I wanted to be alone. I had some praying and begging to do. Please God, do not, do, do not let my children die. We can, we can work this out, Lord. Please, whatever you do, don't, don't let them die. Many of the details of the day are blurred. Luke was driving the red Jeep. He was going to be the heroic big brother who would get his sister to, um, to the theater on time that evening. He, he thought that he could beat the train, the tragic mistake. One of the philosophies of the DuPage Railroad Safety Council is that neither death nor disability should be the punishment for impatient mistakes, whether by seemingly invincible teenagers or impatient distracted adults. Today, we are able to build in engineering features. Brian showed uh, some uh, that, that we love that can help prevent these tragic mistakes. In fact, that kind of engineering has been implemented at the Monroe Street Crossing several years after Lauren's, de Lauren's death. When I arrived at Loyola, I was taken to a surgical waiting room where I joined my grieving wife. We held each other and waited for what seemed like an eternity until the trauma surgeon arrived. She seemed so cold. She was too used to giving bad news, like someone suffering from compassion fatigue. She used several words. I don't remember hardly any of them, but the ones I do remember were, the girl will probably not live long. She didn't even call Lauren by her name. The boy will need lots of help, but he will probably survive. When you're ready, we can take you to see your children. Lauren's brain injuries were too severe. I, sp I suspect her soul may have left her body at the railroad crossing in Hinsdale. We turned off life supports that evening. Well, holding her beautiful hand. Every day, I miss her hugs. I miss her laughter. I even miss the way she smells and miss her fragrance, even today. Luke spent several weeks on life support in a medically induced coma. He gradually recovered, went on to university, and he even married a few years ago. Lauren was an aspiring actress, but on the stage of life, history has assigned her the role of inspirer. Her death inspired me and it inspires others to do whatever we can do to prevent this tragedy from happening in other families. Um, we were listening to inspired people this evening. Some of them know Lauren's story, but uh, they're inspired to help save lives. Joining forces with these kinds of organizations and individuals, including uh, our panelists were on a mission to eliminate deaths and injuries at railroad crossings and along railways. During the 26 years since uh, Lauren's death, we've helped to decrease deaths and injuries at railroad crossings. All over the United States, uh, we're having, we're seeing great successes by engineering the crossings, but deaths and injuries along the railways, that's the, that part of the rail between the crossings, haven't fared nearly so well. That's part of the reason why we're here tonight. In 2016, the DuPage Railroad Safety Council set the ambitious goal of a 50% reduction in the total number of railway related deaths in 10 years. We've got a pretty good start. I feel guilty though, every time I hear about another railway related fatality, because I know that the vast majority of these are preventable. That's the reason why we're here tonight, to help prevent these. 
we're just not working hard enough, I feel. On October the 25th, 1995, about one and a half years after Lauren's death, uh, Brian knows this all too well. That's how he, part of how he got his, uh, some of his inspiration for the work he's, he's doing. Seven children were killed because of a bus train crash in Fox River Grove, Illinois. That just about killed me. Where have all the children gone who died in Fox River Grove? And where have all the people gone who've died along the railways? Where have all these loved ones gone? Gone to graveyards, everyone. Oh, when will we ever learn? Oh, when will we ever learn? You're hearing some of the lessons that we have learned from tonight's panelists. Dreamer that I am, my hope is that our panel presentations tonight will not only help to save lives, but will be a signature turning point towards zero deaths on railroad property in the Chicagoland area and throughout the nation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lanny, so much. I know every time you say these words, it all comes back to you. And we're so grateful that you would share this with us tonight. Thank you so much. My pleasure, thank you. Hillary, you are up next. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lanny. Um, I know how difficult that that I couldn't even imagine, um, you know, being a, a parent of, of two, um, you know, grown children now, but the work that you've done is, I mean, can't even be, can't even, you know, be measured. So thank you for everything that you do. I've known you a long time. Um, we, you know, with the DuPage Rail Safety Council, um, there's been a lot of success, you know, and I just think that you've you've done a lot of good out of something bad and not a lot of people could do that. And I commend you greatly because I don't even I don't think I could do it. So I commend you a, a great deal. Um, Gilda, I'd like to thank, you know, the Glenbard Parent Series for allowing us to present. Um, as Kurt had said, 25 years is phenomenal. I have two grown children, um, and I wish they had this when um, we were growing up, but this is um, phenomenal, so thank you. Um, what I just want to do real quick is a, a lot of people may not really um, realize how big Metra is or the footprint that we cover. Um, we have, uh, Pre-COVID, we operated 692 trains a day. Um, we're still operating about 330 to 350 trains a day. Um, we have 242 stations, 488 route miles um, that go we, on the UP North Line. Um, the Kurt had mentioned goes all the way into Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, and you know, the one fact that I want to point out is we have 565 grade crossings system-wide that um, are a challenge for us, but because we're in a large metropolitan area, the Chicago area is actually the largest rail hub in the country. Um, we have freight and passenger operating on both lines or on our lines and, and vice versa. So there's a lot of rail traffic that, you know, is on our lines, a lot of it, obviously are the Metro trains that we have that operate on our our lines, they operate on a schedule, um, but the freight freight trains don't operate on a schedule. So, um, you know, th that could be problematic for people that trespass along the railroad right of way. Um, just to kind of give a brief um, overview, we do have a robust public outreach education program. We have, um, we, it's based on the three E's, as Brian had said, um, education, enforcement, and engineering activities. So, you know, we adopted the Operation Lifesaver program. It's, you know, they have a lot of resources, which I have the link at the end, but Pre-COVID, we used to do about 950 presentations annually throughout the Chicagoland region. Um, that has come almost to a screeching halt because of the um, COVID situation and 
people homeschooling their children or doing um, remote learning, I should say. Um, but we are um, there are resources if if people parents or organizations want a presentation we can um, work with you to do a zoom presentation uh, we can come out you know if, if there's social distancing and we don't only do schools we do you know community events fairs professional drug truck driver um, truck drivers you know as Kurt had said there's a lot of um, a lot of situations where they you know may leave their trailer overhanging on railroad tracks so we kind of touch on um, that information each presentation is tailored to um, each individual um, classification so to speak we, we have we do school bus drivers and um, we, we do metro safe station safety blitzes um, at all of our 242 stations we do about 50 55 stations a year where we educate you know our customers um, about rail safety as well we have a lot of passengers that may be running late for a train they may run across the tracks um, you know a lot of passengers are creatures of habit unfortunately um, especially in the winter time they'll sit in their cars and wait till the last minute until they see the train or hear the train they'll get out of their cars in the parking lot and then they'll run to the train sometimes they don't realize that the train may be on another track um, so they run in front of the train. So those are some of the things that we, we um, you know, we teach our um, customers or we try to educate them. Um, you know, it's really, it's really interesting because like I said, um, adults are probably the hardest individuals to, um, to educate. And sometimes if you can't educate them, we do have enforcement campaigns as well, where we have a municipal police force of about 130 sworn uh, Metro police officers that we will partner with organizations or, or municipalities to set up um, enforcement blitzes or enforcement campaigns as we call them. So those are, that's kind of like the last resort. We do have some problem areas that we are aware of and we schedule these um, quite often actually. Um, Getting back to the, you know, trespasser, I know Kurt had touched on this a little bit. Um, railroad property is private property. A lot of people don't really realize that. What we see most of the time is um, people using the right of way for shortcuts. Um, you know, a lot of it are, a lot of those are school aged children. Um, we've actually seen people jogging down the right of way. Um, you know, and a lot of adults, believe it or not, don't know that it's illegal to, um, you know, walk along the railroad right of way down the center track or, you know, cross tracks that aren't, um, you know, not at a designated, uh, um, you know, crossing such as a, a um, street or grade crossing. So uh, that's one of the important things that I wanted to highlight. I know that Kurt touched on the uh, trespasser incident, but this is one of the most common um, situations that we see on trespasser um, incidents. And the other thing that I wanna talk about that sometimes we don't really think about, there's a lot of mental, you know, mental health issues nowadays in the, um, in society, especially now, with what's going on and Metro developed it back in 2015 I started reviewing kind of like Steve Laffey or I'm sorry yeah Steve Laffey um, he started um, looking at actual suicides back in 2000 what we started doing at Metro is we started really looking at the events that were occurring on our on our rail lines because we wanted to make sure we were um, mitigating the incidents correctly and, and we've noticed a we, we've noticed a spike in um, suicides or intentional deaths. And um, so, you know, we, we had some concerns and, and I went to a, a presentation or, or a training put on by the Saratoma Sir, Sir group in 2015 to learn more about, um, you know, mental health awareness. And, and it was actually a suicide awareness class. And, you know, I 
kind of the light bulb clicked and, and I thought, what if we could bring this program to Metra and train our employees or teach our employees on what to look for, um, you know, if they see a person distressed, you know, along the railroad right of way, um, you know, know what the warning signs are. Um, if they pass that, you know, pass maybe a, a vehicle that is parked along the railroad right of way and then they, you know, flip their train and come back and it's still there, you know, that may be a sign that somebody's contemplating hurting themselves. So, you know, we implemented the, the program and it's it's been a huge success. All of our conductors, um, trainmen, engineers go through the program. All of our employees that have the opportunity or that may interface with, you know, a passenger or a, a trespasser or a patron along the railroad right of way. And we've actually started tracking, we started tracking the, we call them interventions where we've, um, I've then identified people that were along the railroad right of way, they were in distress and contemplating suicide. And last year we had 72 um, interventions that we you know were able to bring those those people to safety and get them help and then in 2019 we had 61 interventions so the program is working um we've seen a you know a big decline in incidents and uh, you know we just you know we're very pleased with it we also have railroad signage um, that has a suicide prevention lifeline if anybody is in crisis, these are at all of our stations. They can, you know, call the suicide prevention lifeline. And the other um, interesting option is when we were implementing this program, um, you know, there's a lot of millennials, and I hate to use that because my kids look at me like I have three heads, but, you know, I'll call them on the phone. They will not answer me. They will text me back and go, what do you want? And so, you know, we, I, I'm like, you know, we should probably look at a text option. So um, through Dr. Wilson, through Lanny's, um, we were at the DuPage Rail Safety Council and one of the members had introduced me to Crisis Text Line and we, you know, created a partnership with them through an IMOU and we have a text option. If you text, I got you to 741741, um, you'll be, you'll be connected to um, a, a trained um, individual uh, crisis in, you know, crisis help individual that will um, respond to you. And, you know, it's been phenomenal. I've tested it out a couple of times just to make sure that, you know, it does work and, and you know, that they are helping people. And, and to date we've had 127 um, conversations recorded with with crisis text line. The suicide prevention lifeline is a little bit harder to determine how many calls they receive because they don't um, measure or they don't you know they don't look at their data based off of the cell phone tower usage. It's still based off of um, area codes and you know with the invention of cell phones, you can have an area code with 202 and still be in the Chicago region. So it's kind of hard to identify if that is working, but I believe it, it does. And, you know, I think more now than ever with a lot of, um, you know, what we're going through um, in today's climate, I, I think this, this program is, is so important and it, it's helped us help other people in, in need. And I'm, you know, very grateful for this program. And then finally, just, you know, if anybody, you know, wants to find out more about our programs, uh, I put the link up for Metra for our safety education awareness programs. We will be happy to come out, um, you know, educate any group organization, um, any from the age of eight or two actually from daycare, all the way up to 80, 90 years old, we've done senior citizen meetings, um, you know, and those are interesting because a lot of times, you know, they are following their GPS and they turn down the track thinking it's, it's a, it's a street, but, um, and then also Operation Lifesaver is um, an excellent uh, resource as well. 
they've uploaded new um i want to say classes but their their videos and they're interactive especially with covid and um the video you know learning program they just kind of supplemented the lack of in-person presentations with presentations on their on their website so you can access that and if you if anybody needs any information my or you know additional information my information is down at the bottom of the screen so thank you very much that's that's great thank you so much uh dr washburn you take the time this is really important what you have to say all of these gentlemen have been important i want you to take the time with your prepared remarks to tell us what we need to know building on hillary's comments great thank you gilda for putting this on and, and hillary for uh kind of setting the stage for uh, the talk that i want to do and um, Brian and Kurt, you know, thank you for all of the work um, that you have done for uh, working kind of on the, the mechanical side in terms of prevention. And, and Dr. Wilson, I, I can only say thank you for sharing your pain and your tragedy with us and, and turning it around to save lives. And, um, you know, I'm uh, uh, behind you in terms of getting to zero uh, in terms of death uh, on the railway. And, in thinking about uh, death on the railway, one thing that we know for certain is that um, uh, there are certain things that we can prevent. Um, and some of those things, those accidents uh, can be prevented through mechanical means. Uh, mechanical means, uh, you know, engineering, construction though, um, uh, can't change somebody who decides uh, that they wanna take their life on the track. Uh, and so preventing somebody from losing their life on the track uh, can really occur at the start of um, somebody even uh, thinking about going to the track. And so what I want to talk about today is the warning signs uh, that you should pay attention to that would really help prevent somebody from even getting there. Uh, so we're going to quickly walk through some of the most uh, important warning signs for risk for suicide. Um, and I just want to highlight, you know, particularly because this is the, you know, the Glenbard parent series um, that we are focusing here specifically on teens. And so in looking at um, the rates of uh, suicidal thoughts, uh, plans and attempts, what we can see is some pretty significant uh, uh, risk out there. So when we look uh, at these uh, studies that are done every year of high schoolers, we see pretty consistently that about 17% uh, 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 pretty consistently every year will indicate having thoughts of suicide in the past year. That's a huge number. That's a lot of kids who have serious thoughts of taking their own lives. Even more concerning to that, 13% will report uh, having some sort of plan uh, to take their life. Um, and that is also a, a really concerning number. And when we are looking at uh, risk, we can see that risk is fairly high among <laughs> teens. And these are not teens that are showing up to our inpatient unit. These are not teens coming to me for therapy per se. This is a, a general high school population. Those are very high numbers. Uh, even more striking than that, 7.4%, uh, uh, a little less than one out of 10, will indicate a, uh, uh, an attempt in the past year on their, on their own life. So we see that there are lots of concerns with the mental health of our, uh, our teens. And when we look at um, uh, you know, the rates, we do see that even though the, the highest risk are males between the ages of 40 and 60, we do also see a disproportionate amount of death uh, related to suicide on the tracks uh, among our teens. So what I wanna talk about next is what are the things that we wanna look for in uh, our teens before they actually get to the track. Uh, and I have a list of things here. Hopefully it's not too difficult to see. Uh, uh, what I refer to as early warning signs. These are the things that um, we wanna pay attention to uh, that indicate that somebody might be struggling with uh, possibly suicidal thoughts or maybe even making a plan um, or possibly uh, 
uh, actually engaging in a suicide attempt. So a lot of these are signs of depression. Uh, so kind of withdrawing from friends and families, uh, uh, having um, difficulty concentrating, significant change in their mood or personality, um, you know, changing in eating habits or sleep habits, uh, not being interested in the things that they used to be interested in, uh, complaining about physical symptoms like stomach aches or headaches a lot when there's no um, uh, physical explanation for that. Uh, being bored a lot, just not being interested in thing, uh, things that they used to care about or things that you would expect them to, to find pleasure in. Uh, and then certainly having a preoccupation with, with death, um, showing some difficulties at school as well. So these, uh, these signs here are signs that uh, suggest that there might be some form of depression that's going on uh, with your your teen, it also could indicate um, that something else is happening. So, you know, typically one of these things in and of themselves might not be a problem. Uh, certainly preoccupation with death is going to be concerning uh, regardless, uh, but that might be because uh, somebody died recently in their family um, and they're having a hard time getting over it, they're grieving, uh, and that might be part of a normal process. When you, however, see several of these coming together at the same time, that's where you get concerned. And that's where you wanna to start to, to take action and not let it um, just sit and get worse. So again, these are the early warning signs, the things that suggest that, you know, maybe we need to do something. Maybe we need to pay attention more um, than we perhaps are in that moment. Next, I wanna walk through the late warning signs. What are the things that we, might, that might indicate to us that there might be a concern for um, somebody taking their life uh, in, the, in the imminent future. Um, so obviously if they're talking directly about it, they're telling you, you know, I have a plan to kill myself, or they're talking a lot about death. Um, uh, they're talking about harming themselves. Um, that's gonna be a very clear sign that you want to pay attention to. Whoops, excuse me. Um, you also want to never um, brush off that kind of talk. You wanna always take that kind of talk serious. You also wanna be clear not to shut that kind of talk down. So you don't wanna say, hey, don't say that, don't ever talk about that because then they're just gonna stop talking about that to you. You want them to still talk about this with you if this is what's going on with them. Uh, you want them to communicate this and you wanna take it seriously. Uh, you also want to be concerned if suddenly their impulsive behavior starts to increase. They become more violent, uh, more rebellious. Uh, they start running away. Um, they really see that that kind of change in personality we talked about before, but, but getting to see it at a more significant level. Um, we want to make sure that, that we uh, pay attention to that. Again, that could be a bunch of different things, but it definitely is indicating that something is going on. If they stop talking to you, they're refusing help. Um, they say things like, well, nobody can help me anymore. I'm beyond help. Um, you know, it's useless, why try? Uh, that is also an indication that perhaps things are getting worse to the point where you might need to do something or that they're thinking about doing something. When you start to hear a lot of kind of negative talk about themselves, really significant negative talk, you know, complaining about being a bad person, about feeling rotten inside, um, about self-hatred. Uh, we get this a lot in kids who um, start to engage in non-suicidal self-injury. They start to cut themselves or hit themselves. Uh, they talk about how much they hate themselves. Uh, when that starts to happen, that's a, that's a sign that things are not going well. Um, and when that's combined with some of the other things that we've talked about before, that should really worry us uh, about the potential for suicide. And also the more subtle statements, you know, in the beginning we, of these late warning signs, we talked about the more direct statements, but also the more subtle statements about just feeling hopeless. Like, you know, it's just not worth it. Or, you know, I try and I try and nothing gets better. Um, you know, I just feel like I can't do anything. I can't make a change. Um, or I just don't feel like I'm worth it anymore or that, um, uh, that I'm not uh, worth it to others either. Some other warning signs here is, you know, when you try to praise them and they, they just brush it off or um, uh, they get a reward and don't seem to care about it. Uh, you 
um, uh, suddenly uh, see them giving away favorite possessions and uh, you're not clear why they're doing this. And uh, that's going to be a real clear sign that something might happen. Uh, same with writing a note or making a will. Uh, that indicates that they might be really close uh, to doing something. Uh, obviously, when they say it directly, when they say, I am going to do this, and they might not be saying that to you. They might be saying it to friends or to other family members. And so you want them to also understand uh, that when you have a, a child who is at risk, um, that if and they say anything like this to you, that they need to uh, or say anything like that to them that they need to contact you immediately they need to to seek out help immediately uh, again they also might be giving hints with their statements as we talked about before um, they also a, a really important one might suddenly become incredibly cheerful after a period of depression uh, they have been struggling for a long time you've been worried about um, their suicide risk for a long time and then suddenly um, they seem fine you might be incredibly relieved as a parent and that's com you know, completely normal, but that is an indication possibly, and I would say likely uh, that they have made a decision and things are better for them because they have made a decision to end it. Uh, and that is a big red flag, uh, along with giving away possessions, making a note that suggests that something imminent might happen. So all of these signs suggest that we need to do something. Um, now, if you are in a situation where it is just you, you should ask about suicide if you are concerned about it. Uh, and if you are going to do that, uh, it's best to be done with a professional. Uh, these days though, that is hard to do. So if you can't get a professional and you are worried, you can ask directly about it yourself. You can seek privacy and start with some open-ended, non-threatening kind of general questions, uh, getting them to just open up. Uh, you can then kind of dig a little deeper and asking about how they are feeling, uh, letting them know that you're concerned about them, that, uh, that it's normal to have these kind of feelings, but those feelings might also be getting worse lately, um, that uh, they might seem um, uh, at a point where, you know, it's gone past just normal feeling sad, angry, or irritable. The important piece, though, is that you ask directly about suicide. You ask them directly about if they have ever thought about um, or actually hurt themselves, or if they had ever just wanted to end it all, um, or just more directly, have you thought about killing yourself or, or wished you were dead? It's important to ask directly. And sometimes when I say this to parents, they look at me like I'm crazy. Why would I ever plant that idea in their head? Let me tell you that decades of research has shown that asking about suicide prevents suicide. There is not one shred of data that suggests that asking about suicide plants it. It does not. Asking about suicide opens up a door for somebody who feels alone, who feels as if they have no other option um, to actually talk about what's going on and to actually come up with different options. So I strongly encourage you, even though it's hard, if you're worried to talk about it. If they say yes, the most important thing is to remain calm. Don't freak out, right? Don't lose it in front of them. Certainly you might tear up a little bit, that's okay, but stay calm, use an empathic expression, you know, talk with empathy with a calm voice tone. And more important than anything, validate how they're feeling, acknowledge that deep despair and provide them with reassurance. I hear you, I'm gonna help you. We're gonna get you what you need to get over this. This is not the end. And then immediately get them an urgent evaluation. That could be taking them to the emergency room. That could be calling the emergency, calling some of the um, helplines uh, that Hillary was talking about before. Uh, it could be um, calling 911 if you, if you think you need help immediately. If they say no, Continue to show your love, continue to validate and, uh, their feelings and express empathy. Look for the, and prioritize the positive, but also be realistic about how they are actually feeling and continue to monitor for signs and symptoms. And certainly consider getting services. If you're concerned, reach out and get help. One thing that this awful pandemic, which we know is worsening the mental health of, of all of us, uh, our children, as well as us, we know that it's making things worse, but we also know 
that telepsychology, telehealth works. It is certainly not a full replacement for everybody, but is a, it is a really good replacement for most people. You can get help. And if telehealth doesn't work, you can get in-person help. So that is a very clear outcome that's positive from this pandemic. One of the few ones that's positive is that we know that you can get help in multiple ways. So do not hesitate to reach out and to get that help. And with that, I'm just gonna say thank you again. I'm sorry, I'm five minutes over um, and I'm gonna turn it back to you, Gilda. Um, but thank you all again for, for this incredible panel. Jason, thank you so much. Uh, you know, as you were concluding your remarks that what struck me, your that imp uh, two important points, certainly the fact um, that decades of research shows that asking about suicide opens up a door. Um, I think for so long, the thinking was you're planting a seed and there's still so many people that, that think that's the attitude of the day. And we know that's not the case. And I, and I really love, you know, you went beyond that and what, what are the words to say? And, and certainly, I, you know, we hear this from so many of our speakers, how important it is that empathetic listening that's happening today, you know, with our kids, um, with these challenges around COVID, uh, you don't want to say, well, at least you have a roof on your head and we have food on the table. That's not helping. We want to have them we speak to that for a minute would you what what do we say to these kids that are that are really that are struggling in isolation now well you know what i say to my own kids is this stinks um this is hard and this is difficult um and even on good days you know it's it's tough and we need to validate that um and we can both be thankful for what we have and also acknowledge what has been taken from us and yeah. how difficult this is. Um, the most privileged people in the world can feel pain. The most privileged people in the world can suffer from mental health symptoms. And that suffering is equally as hard. Um, and so we need to acknowledge both, right? Um, and more importantly, we need to validate what our children are feeling and sometimes provide them the words that they don't even have. Um, and give them that language about the emotion that we're seeing. A lot of kids have a jumble of emotions. Uh, they're, when you ask them how they feel, they say, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm happy um, uh, for what I, you know, I'm grateful for what I have, but I'm also just tired and I'm sick of this, right? They just feel all of it. And sometimes they don't even know how to put that into words. So we need to help them to have those emotions and to express those emotions. And we can also model that. And show that, that, hey, I can say I'm sad. I can say that I'm upset and I'm still okay, right? A lot of times we think when we have a distressing emotion that we're just going to blow up. We're not. We're going to have that emotion. It's going to peak. It's going to be awful. And then it gets better, right? And where we make things worse is when we react to that emotion. We, we, are, we allow that emotion to drive our behavior. And that's where depression comes in and anxiety comes in and substance use comes in and eating disorders comes in and suicidal thoughts and behavior come in. Mm. That is really so helpful. And Jericho, will you show that slide? This actually, what you've just expressed is exactly what we're gonna be talking about next week. We have John Duffy coming. He is the author of a book called Parenting the New Teen in the Age of Anxiety. He will be speaking Wednesday night at 7 p.m. to the community, understanding your child's stress, depressed, and amazing adolescents. At noon, there is a workshop for professionals, for school staff and professionals. Parents are welcome to both of these, and everybody is always welcome. And then we'll be talking about college in February. So I really encourage people to go to the website and, and look at all of the resources that are here. For example, this program will be recorded. You will now find this on the page that is will be a past event. This will be a past event, and you'll find the recording there and other resources. We'll link you to all of the wonderful resources that these gentlemen have shared with us tonight. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time. Lanny, 
There are no words. So many people are texting me and writing me and from their hearts, they are so grateful for you. And Lanny, take us uh, with some closing thoughts, if you will, please, Dr. Wilson. Uh, I, I appreciate you pulling this group together this evening, Gilda, my goodness. You know, each of these gentlemen could have spoken a full hour themselves and to try to pack all this information into this hour. I think they did a phenomenal job. Yeah. And we're, we're just a, a few minutes beyond the, uh, the scheduled time. But I wanna thank you and thank the GPS uh, organization for making this possible. You know, you, you all are partners in railroad safety. You're partners in helping us save lives. And, and I have no doubt that this evening we will make a difference in the lives of every person who was out there listening. So thank you, Gilda, for this opportunity. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you to our guests and participants. And come back and stay safe out there. Absolutely. Have a good evening. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.